Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Old South Meeting House. My name is Zara Jacob, and I am the Visitor Services and Program Assistant here. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our event tonight, which has been generously funded by the Lowell Institute. So Boston is a city famous for its revolutionary roots. Visitors come from all around the world to visit our Old North Church, Castle Island, and to walk the historic Freedom Trail. But there's another story to Boston's history for which these landmarks play a key role. In the shadow of the very locations where Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and Dr. Joseph Warren planned a revolution and organized the mob to do their bidding, a very different kind of mob has grown. This mob is one which recognizes the names of Angelo, Flemmy, Bennett, and of course, the infamous Whitey, amongst others. Tonight, joining us are Stephanie Shero and Beverly Ford, authors of the Boston Mob Guide, Hitmen, Hoodlums, and Hideouts. They'll be discussing the underbelly of Boston's current mob scene. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie and Beverly. Hello. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Stephanie. This is Bev. Um, we really appreciate you coming out to this wonderful building. I love this building. It has so much history, um, so much activity, and it says so much about Boston. So I'm really pleased that you come to this historic building to hear about bad guys. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, so we are often asked, uh, both, both Bev and I know each other from working at the Boston Herald uh, together many years ago. Really, that's what, here's our subscriber right over here. Thank you, thank you. There were two of you, I might have been able to stay working there, but no. that's okay. Um, but we worked together uh, uh, at, the, at the Herald, and um, I'm the author of some other books about Boston history. I'm absolutely fascinated with Boston history. So people often ask, well, why did you write this book on the mob? And uh, the, the real short answer is that um, I was approached by the history press about this, and, we, and, and I talked to Bev, and basically they made us an offer we could not refuse. So we worked very hard in putting together our idea of what a mob ga guide should be. So let's start getting into it. So the first question that we had to answer in putting together our book is why do another book on the mob? And there's a lot of books out there. How many people know, well, you must know over there, Howie Carr and Howie Carr's books and uh, many of the mobsters. Have, have, how many people have read another a mob book here like that? See, there, so there are, and, and many of these are written by the mobsters themselves. So the question we had was, well, why write another one? And as we were doing our real research, we realized there really was a need for the kind of book we did, in the sense that you need an encyclopedia, you need an ABCs, a mobster 101, so to speak, that explains everything about this history, which is both fascinating and very tragic. Oops, wrong way. All right, so let's explain why we're gonna do this. So we're gonna start out with a very handy-dandy mobster flow chart, which will kind of explain how we've organized things. So starting out, we're, in one thing we did in our book was we went way back in time to the 1920s, 1930s to a guy named Charles King Solomon. We also went back to uh, the early Irish gangs of Boston we also went back to the early Italian mobs of Boston in the North End. We talk about Raymond Patriarca out of Rhode Island. The Angiulo family, how many people here know of the Angiulo family? I, yes, I thought so. Uh, talk about them and their relationships, the South Boston gang, and that, that we talk, this is about Irish groups that were organized around neighborhoods. Um, we even found some tie-ins with the Brinks robbery, which is a book, I wrote a book about the Brinks robbery, and I found a lot of tie-ins between that and some of the people uh, work, and some of the other people on this flow chart. Let's see, here we go. Uh, and then, of course, there was the Winter Hill Gang, based in Somerville. And that led to the Irish Mob War, which was between some of the thugs in Somerville and the thugs in Charlestown, which went on for quite a long time. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then we're gonna get into some names that I'm sure you've heard about. Frank, Cadillac Frank Salemi, Joseph the Animal Barboza, and then we have to talk about the FBI and their role in this, because not only did the FBI 
trying to catch these people, that in some cases they were working with some of these people, and that's another very unusual aspect of Boston's mob history. Steve the Rifleman Flemmy, I'm sure you've all heard of him. And there's people like Johnny Martirano, Kevin Weeks, who was, a, who was a protege of James Whitey Bulger. So there's our flow chart, but wait, there's more. So here are some of the other names that we cover and kind of how they relate to these other mobsters. I won't go through them, but as you can see, when we were organizing this, it was very hard to keep everything straight. Take a good look at that. Has everyone got that? There'll be a quiz tomorrow on that. So the idea is that this mob history is very complicated and very interconnected. And I think that's a marker of Boston history in general. When you look at the Patriots, when you look at the Brahmins, the Blue Bloods, when you look at many of the uh, Transcendentalists, all of them were interconnected and intermarried. And the same with the mob, only in the mob's case, they were interconnected uh, by blood, by friendship, and then they also were killing each other as well, which make it, made it a little different. So, let me go back in time and talk about one of the early mobsters that you may or may not have heard about. This is a gentleman named Charles King Solomon. Has anyone heard about him? He was, um, first of all, one thing about him is that he was of Russian Jewish ancestry, as far as we know. He may have been born in the United States, or he may have been born elsewhere and naturalized here. And in fact, all the sources indicate that he was born in Russia and brought here. But just the other week, I was doing a little more research, and I found out he might have been born in Syria and come here, which is another example of the way history is always changing. You think things are set in stone, but you're always finding out more things about him. Well, Charles Solomon, who was later nicknamed King Solomon, he grew up in Salem and um, worked as a, he was a very good dancer. He worked at a lunch counter. But very, very quickly, he got sucked into a life of crime. And so from a very early age, he was involved with dope and dope smuggling, drugs, and prostitution and running prostitution rings. He actually went to jail, a federal prison for a while, but got out. And then something happened, and that was prohibition. And he got involved with bootlegging and bringing in, in a very, very vast way, huge quantities of booze. In fact, as in January 8th of 1933, there was a federal indictment that he was one of the people running a $14 million enterprise bringing in alcohol into Boston. But there's one other thing that King Solomon is known for. And that is he ran a very famous nightclub for a short while in Boston. Can anyone remember, does anyone know what nightclub that might have been? Had a big fire. Coconut Grove, yes, thank you. You all get A's. Um, yes, in 1931, Charles Solomon bought the Coconut Grove nightclub. And so at the same time he was running a lot of booze, he was, always, he was also running a very popular, very prominent nightclub. And he was in the limelight there. He hated publicity, but he liked to be the center of attention. It was a very odd combination. So he would come to the club every night, dressed to the nines, dressed up, walk around, greet customers, ask them how their evening was going. You like your steak? You don't like it? I'll send it back, get you a new one. Um, and so he played this very prominent role, and he hobnobbed with the stars and everybody that came into the Coconut Grove that night. But he also had a darker side. Even as he was being a showman, he um, also didn't know when to quit. And so one night after closing up the Coconut Grove, he went to an after-hours uh, nightclub. It was an African-American, a black uh, bar, uh, if, or it wasn't a bar exactly, but it was a musical place, uh, on Tremont, Tremont Street, um, and was hanging out there Come on, there we go. In uh, this is what the what this is the place. It was called the Cotton Club, and he was at one of these tables. He was with a couple young ladies. He was with his band leader, and then as he was going to the bathroom, he was accosted by four men, who hustled him inside the bathroom. An argument broke out, shots rang out. The men fled, 
and King Solomon staggered out holding his stomach saying, the dirty rats, they got me. And that was in the Herald. So we know that it was correct. Anyway, that was... That was in January 1933, and so he died, and his club later passed on to um, a man named Barney Wolanski, and that's another story of the tragedy that then befell. Here is a headline um, just showing you how prominent he was at the time. Here is a gangster headline news when he is assassinated. And this is a very interesting picture. This is actually from the Boston Public Library Flickr site. This is King Solomon's funeral procession in Brooklyn, and you'll notice all the hundreds of people who came out to pay, to pay their respects to this gangster. So he, he really was a very interesting person that he had um, a lot of underworld ties, but yet he had connections with a lot of people in very prominent places. Um, two people were eventually um, arrested for his, for, and, and tried and uh, convicted of his killing, and his name is past in obscurity. He's really known today only as the brief, briefly the owner of the uh, Coconut Grove. So now we're going to turn to Bev and talk about the early Irish gangs. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Guston Gang. Has anyone heard of the Guston Gang? No? Well, there was no one, none of the members were named Guston. For one thing. Um, the Guston Gang was there's this, they, they were named after a street in South Boston where they hung out, and here's a, a recent photograph of the street sign. And they used to hang out here. Um, the gang was comprised of Frank Wallace and two of his siblings, um, Stephen James. And uh, they started uh, running a bootlegging o operation in around the 19, 1910. And that's when they were first noticed by police. They began hijacking and looting delivery trucks, and then they'd start you know, robbing uh, trucks full of booze. And they, they kind of gained a, a reputation in, uh, in the South Boston area. They became one of the most organized and powerful criminal enterprises in Prohibition era Boston. Um, they would come in into uh, places where this booze was uh, being distributed and flash fake ID, ba fake uh, police badges, re uh, revenue badges. and. Um, they t quickly took over much of the business in the city. They were impersonating Prohibition era agents, and uh, they'd come in and steal this booze, and then they'd deliver it to speakeasies throughout the city. Um, all three uh, had few convictions on their records, though, despite having uh, arrests, numerous arrests. They, um, there's rumors that um, they were quite good friends with several politicians in Boston. Hard to imagine that. Um, then three days before Christmas in 1931, things came to an end. Their luck ran out. Um, that was when they met up with Italian gangsters in the North End. They were called to a meeting by the head of the Italian mob at the time, whose name was Frank Lombardo. And they went up to uh, Hanover Street. They went to a meeting at Lombardo's office. He ran a um, import-export business. And um, once they walked in, gunfire erupted. And one brother died in the shooting. Um, a, one of the henchmen was also killed. And one of the other brothers managed to run down the hall and hide in the office of a, a lawyer until the cops came. And what you see here is the aftermath. You could, uh, Stephanie showed you an earlier picture of um, the interior uh, with the Boston police examining uh, you know, the scene. And later we see this picture. This building is still on Hanover Street. If you go up uh, the North End and you, you walk down Hanover Street, that building is still there. In fact, this is a recent photo of that. And if you'll notice in the last shot, there was a lot of people crowding around. Well, that's how they uh, learned about the shooting. So. Uh, you know, there was obviously no TV or, or uh, internet at the time, and people heard about the shooting, they gathered outside the building. Um, they later found seven handguns at the scene, and um, coincidentally, nobody was ever charged. Uh, it was, this ambush was later to become one of the most infamous mob hits in the city. Um, it was also kind of a turning point in mob history here in Boston because with the Wallace brothers now out of the picture, the 
Italian mob gained in status and it allowed the Italians to establish themselves as a dominant criminal organization in the city for the first time in and they, which they eventually ruled for about 50 years. So that's the story of the Gustins. And here is a, this is a photo and a mugshot and um, fingerprints of Joseph Lombardo. And the next photo is of his brother Pasquale. They were both suspects in that um, slaying on Hanover Street and neither of them was ever charged. Does anyone recognize this guy? Raymond Patriarca. The interesting thing about Raymond Patriarca was that he was the head of the New England mob, but he didn't live in Boston. And we all think that, you know, living here in Boston, the Boston's the bigger city. He operated out of um, Providence. And um, all the Italian mobsters, the Jerry Angiulo, they paid homage to him in Providence. Um, Angiulo kind of gained his um, status in the mob because he used to bring the uh, receipts from the bookie operations, the racetracks and, you know, the gambling operations. He used to deliver that to uh, Raymond Patriarca in Providence. So he kind of became buddy-buddy with Raymond. And um, he, here's a, this is a photo of him uh, in court. You could see uh, Jerry Angela there on the uh, upper left. And he's with his brothers and he's conferring with his attorneys. Um, I worked for the Boston Herald for a long time and I, I covered... Um, uh, courts and, and crime, and um, I covered these guys when they were in court, and I could tell you, um, Jerry Angiulo, Larry Zanino, you know, to see them, to walk up to them, they were little guys, and I used to always think, well, how do these guys, you know, frighten so many people? Uh, they're just, they're, they're tiny people, you know? They were, they were smaller than I, was, I am, and, um, you know, but Jerry could give you a fierce look, and um, he was just ruthless. He was ruthless. He was, he would be a gentleman in the um, courtroom, but you know, on the street, I think he was very well, I don't know if I want to say respected, but feared more, I think. And um, the Angelos kind of ruled, the, ruled from the north end, and this is Prince Street in uh, Boston, where the Angelos were raised uh, by their immigrant parents who um, came from Italy in the um, early part of the century. And the, the interesting thing about Boston is that we live in such a historic area. If you go, still go up to the North End, you could walk down, this, walk down the same streets that Jerry Angelo walked. And um, his home is actually on the right-hand side of this photo. It's the um, last building here on the right. And you can almost get the same feeling as you walk, walk through the streets that w what must have been going on in his mind is, as you walk through the North End on Prince Street. Um, the brothers grew up in, in this neighborhood and um, they worked, you know, they worked in their father's fruit stand and kind of, kind of a normal upbringing. And that's what's so unusual about a lot of these guys. They're, they're so normal in a sense. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, this photo shows where they operated out of. This was their office, so to speak. And uh, a lot of you may remember this from the, I believe it was the 1980s when um, the federal agents uh, wired this office for sound. And uh, this is what led to the eventual indictments of the Angelo boys. And the interesting thing about that is the person who helped the FBI, gave the inf FBI the information on how to do this operation, how to wire this building, where to place the microphones, what time the Angelos would be there, all the pertinent information that the feds needed um, to build their case was uh, Whitey Bulger. So um, he really set up the Angelos for the downfall. And if you examined uh, the way that Whitey operated, he did that to just about everyone, every gang in the city. And he worked with these guys too. I mean, they had like, you know, they worked together and, you know, they had, they had truces and, you know, they operated. And it's amazing how they all join together. Uh, we can't, in this lecture, really talk about every single mobster. We're trying to give you an idea of some of the early ones. But one thing we're trying to get here is not only some of the leaders of the mob, but some of what we would call the foot soldiers who um, played a role in um, the different um, aspects of the mobsters. Like this gentleman, um, Joseph Russo, or J.R. Russo, 
um, is another is a foot soldier in the operation. Um, he play he he was the genius with the carbine. Is that he was called a genius with the carbine by um, Ilario Zanino, who's another mobster. You might have heard that name. He's associated with the Angelo family. Um, he was a hitman extraordinaire. And um, do you, do you want to talk about just, what he's memorable for? I was just to say, he, yeah, he was he was he was well known as a hitman. But there's one thing that distinguishes him from other mobsters, and that is it's his voice that is heard when the FBI was able to wiretap a mafia induction ceremony in my hometown of Medford um, some years ago. What happened was that the FBI managed to turn someone who was going to the ceremony, they wired him up, and they recorded uh, all the events, the burning of a, of a picture of the Virgin and a drawing of blood and this kind of thing. And before that point, there was still plausible deniability that there even was a mafia. I mean, many, many Italian Americans protested, not without reason, that they were being stereotyped. And they said, well, there really isn't a mafia. Well, this wiretaping in Medford proved that not only was there a mafia, but it had a set of rules and a set of regulations. And J.R. Russo's voice is the one that is heard very prominently reciting these things, leading the ceremony. So he has this kind of notorious niche in this, um, in this history. Um, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about our friend Gigi here? Um, Gigi Portello is not a big name in mob history, but Gigi Portello has a very funny story to add to the annals of mob crime. Um, Gigi Portello was at a nightclub on the North Shore one night with some of his other gangster friends, and um, some rivals drove up and started firing at these guys. I believe he was with Cadillac Frank Salami. And uh, Gigi took one in the buttocks. And he uh, ended up in the hospital where they removed the bullet. And three weeks later, the Drug Enforcement Administration stopped Gigi Portella and arrested him. And in the booking procedure, one of the drug enforcement agents just happened to mention that, um, you remember when you were at the hospital a couple weeks ago? Uh, we put a uh, monitoring device in your butt. Well, Gigi didn't take that very lightly. He was pretty serious about it. He went to the um, American Civil Liberties Union and wanted the ACLU to file a complaint um, that he had this device in his butt. Um, it got to the point, I mean, I remember talking about this in the newsroom and cracking jokes about it. And I mean, there was jokes on the street. and. Um, it ended up that uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office had to issue a press release saying that um, we did not implant any device in Mr. Portella's butt, but we cannot confirm or deny whether it was done by space aliens or UFOs. And uh, needless to say, Gigi Portella became the butt of many jokes in Boston. We had you know, to say it's it. It's a bad joke. <laughs> We'll talk just a little bit about some of the uh, Irish gangs in Boston. And one of the things that's interesting is that um, so many of the uh, gangs or mob organized crime were organized around neighborhood, which uh, begs the question, and we were asked about this last night, what is the difference between a gang, a mob, an organized crime? And the distinctions really do blur. Uh, but there were a number of groups, if you will, in South Boston, and this one of them was organized around this square, the Mullen Square, uh, and there was called the Mullen Gang. Um, this particular gang, you've known about the Winter Hill Gang, and it was organized around the area of Winter Hill in Somerville, even though at one point it was run by a guy named Howie Winter, but that was just coincidental that that happened. Um, one thing about the Winter Hill Gang that I'll touch on briefly is that from between 1961 and 1976, this particular group of uh, people in Somerville and people in Charlestown had huge beefs with each other and other people. It wasn't strictly neighborhood. It crossed a lot of paths, but it was bloody, and it went on. It started in uh, Labor Day 1961 when the two gangs had an altercation, apparently one um, 
particular mobster groped another mobster's girlfriend. He was beaten up. His, his boss or leader went to the other boss and said, we need to have revenge. Someone refused, and so it started to become a tit-for-tat with one person wiping out somebody else and then his brother wiping out someone else. It would, I mean, I've tried to explain all this. It's all explained in the book, but it's really very complicated. It's worse than the Hatfields and McCoys. Um, and one thing I will say about this is that it was covered in great, to a great extent by the newspapers of the day, but the newspapers of the day almost looked at it as kind of a sporting event, a sort of a blood sport, if you will, because the idea was, well, there's these bad guys killing off each other. But we have to take a step back and realize Yes, that might have been happening, but there were wives, there were mothers, there were sons, there were daughters, there were innocent bystanders that were all being affected by this. Um, this picture here is um, from a 1966. This was one of the last of the murders in this gang wars of Connie Hughes. He was gunned down um, as he was driving on, on Route 1, for going from Malden to Revere. Um, a couple days later, this is Connie Hughes, and a couple days later, his brother, Steve Hughes, was, was slain. This is a, a gentleman named Punchy McLaughlin. Many of the people in the gang wars were McLaughlins. Punchy actually survived two attempts on his life. And then in 1965, he was gunned down on this corner, West Roxbury. And this is a very chilling picture. Um, the Punchy was actually waiting for the bus when someone came up and took him out. But photographers apparently went to the spot and asked children in the neighborhood to reenact the scene. So what you're seeing is they said, oh, why don't you show us what happened? And so they're sort of doing it kind of gleefully. And it's, a, it's kind of chilling in the way that this material, this, these kind of killings were not taken very seriously. And I think there's something to be said today when we're looking at violence and we say, say oh, well, they're just killing each other off. We don't have to worry about that. But I think that's a very dangerous, dangerous uh, uh, situation to fall into. Um, and to illustrate that, this is a shot of, of uh, Johnny Martirano, who was one of the most notorious hitmen in uh, Boston's history. Um, he, con he said he killed 20 people that he can remember. Uh, he, I'm not going to go into all his victims' names. It's actually kind of hard to find out all the people. But I'm just going to tell you about three of them, because I think this is uh, particularly egregious. I mean, Raderano played a lot of roles. He was a hitman for Whitey Bulger and Steve Fleming. And we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, in a while. But at one point, he did a killing for uh, one of Fleming's brothers, um, Jimmy the Bear, uh, who just wanted a, an, uh, a manager of a black club. It was an African-American, a guy taken out. He had to be with them. So Maderana decided to shoot this guy who was sitting in a car. He shot, there were three people in the car. He shot all three of them. One of them was a 17-year-old girl named Elizabeth Dixon. And, excuse me, she was 19 years old. And then there was a 17-year-old boy named Douglas Barrett. All three were African-American, and the the coverage of this was, was put, was said, oh, well, there's this bizarre killing, and then it was never followed up. But it turned out to be uh, Johnny Moderano who was responsible for that. Now we'll talk about another uh, notorious character. Um, I mentioned before how normal a lot of these guys seemed, and you'll, you'll see that also in, in talking about uh, Joe Barboza, and also when we talk a little bit later about um, Steve Fleming. But um, the, Joe Barboza uh, was born of a port Portuguese immigrant parents. He grew up in New Bedford. Um, he followed in his father's footsteps and became, a, a, you know, tried out a, a career as a professional boxer, worked as a longshoreman, worked on a local fruit stand. He was good looking. He loved animals. He loved kids. Women loved him. And although he lacked a formal education, he spoke three languages, and he was an exceptional chef. He would cook up Portuguese and French dishes. So it's kind of like, sounds like, you know, the ideal man, anyway, to me, anyway. <laughs> he liked to cook, so. <laughs> um, but crime was his real passion, and he pursued it with a vengeance. Um, by the time he was 12 years old, he was in reform school because he was such a bad, bad actor. Um, but despite his criminal 
tendencies. He never gained a notice by the mob until, um, until 1958 when he had a legendary encounter with a mob underboss by the name of Henry Tamelio. And that, this encounter cemented his relationship as a mob hitman. Um, one of the stories goes that he was in a bar in uh, north, north of Boston. He was drinking, and a, an elderly Italian man was also in the bar. And Barboza was pretty loud and raucous and obnoxious. And he had some words with this elderly Italian gentleman. Well, um, the mob underboss, Henry Tamelio, didn't like uh, what he saw and because Barboza slapped this Italian guy across the face. And he yells to Barboza, he says to him, um, I, don't ever wanna, I don't ever want you to slap that man. I don't want you to touch anybody with your hands again. After which, Joe Barboza walked over to the Italian gentleman and bit his ear off. Um, and he s turns around and he says to uh, Henry Tamelio, I didn't touch him with my hands. And that's how the legend of the animal was born. Um, Joe Barboza was a real bad character. He was the, one of the most notorious and feared hitmen in Boston. He was ruthless. Um, but in but around 1966, he was careless as well. And uh, he, he started becoming a, a liability to his mob um, handlers. Then, in around October 1966, he was arrested on a weapons charge while cruising the combat zone in Boston. And um, it was that arrest that led to his epiphany, because he sat in jail on a $100,000 bail, awaiting um, his mob friends to come in and bail him out, and nobody ever did. So he sat there, and that's when he realized that, you know, th maybe these guys don't want me around. Uh, a little while later, he heard a rumor that he was on a mob hit list, and that's when he went to the FBI and turned to state's evidence. Um, this is an example of the. This is an example of the letter, uh, which is actually preserved, that he wrote, saying, "I'm going to take the stand against these guys," and admitting that he would uh, turn state evidence on this. When he testified, he put um, Raymond Patriarch in federal prison. Uh, he also put away four mob associates um, and handed life sentences to two others. In return for his testimony, now you have to remember this guy was a notorious hitman. In return for his testimony, he got a one-year prison sentence and he was paroled into the witness protection program. In fact, he became the first person in the witness protection program. So he shipped out to California, to Santa Rosa, California. Um, two years after being shipped out to Santa Rosa, he gets hit with a second degree murder charge and was sentenced to five years in, in federal prison. But um, Joe Barboza used that prison sentence to his advantage. He became a well-known artist and a poet. Uh, despite that softer side, the Mafia still pursued him, and they eventually caught up with him. Uh, because shortly after he was released, less than three months, as a matter of fact, shortly after he was released from Folsom Prison, um, J.R. Russo, who we spoke about earlier as uh, the gentleman who was known um, for giving the oath of Omerta on uh, tape to the feds, uh, J.R. Russo went out to California and blew Joe the animal away in a hail of gunfire um, as he walked to his car. So that was the end of Joe the Animal Barboza. So let's talk for a minute about Whitey Bulger. Uh, we're not going to go through a lot of details about him. This has been very much in the, in the news lately. But we're going to look just briefly at one of the key questions about Whitey. And, it, and it's why he is just such a fascinating character. Um, certainly, we've been talking about a lot of violent people and a lot of terrible things that they've done, but somehow Whitey Bulger seems to be the one that captures our imagination. Here is him. Uh, here he is in 1953. He's a very early mugshot. He's in the one from 1955 as a young man. And I think one of the reasons that he is so fascinating is because you see such a stark contrast between him and other members of his family, in particular his 
his brother Billy Bulger, who is pictured here with the late Joe Moakley. And so he, he, the, the case of Whitey brings up this question of what makes a criminal, nature or nurture? I mean, here was a gentleman who um, grew up in South Boston, had a lot of advantages, and look, his brother went on to be the president of the Massachusetts Senate, a very well-regarded uh, politician. But you can also see some similar threads between, between the two of them. They were both ruthless. They are both very good at what they did. They both made a lot of enemies. But one operated on this side of the law, and the other operated clearly on the other side of the law. Although with politicians, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. So here are some other pictures of Whitey from other periods. This is from a surveillance photo with his protege, Kevin Weeks. Uh, this is a, a photo when they moved their headquarters out of Winter Hill into Boston to a garage where they were under surveillance by state police, but the FBI seemed to be reluctant to prosecute them. Uh, another picture, a surveillance picture with Whitey and his protege, Kevin Weeks. Uh, another from Castle Island. I run at Castle Island all the time, and I, I love this feeling that I'm running in Whitey Bulger's former office, because this is where they would go, because they could be viewed, but they couldn't be overheard. Um, one of the other characters who helped make Whitey's reputation was Steve the Rifleman Flemmy. Um, we'll just talk about him very briefly. Um, Steve Flemmy, talk about normal. Steve Flemmy was another uh, normal guy. He, uh, does anyone know how he got, got his name, the Rifleman, by the way? Is anybody? No? Um, when I worked for the Herald, I thought it was because he was, um, you know, he killed people with a rifle. I didn't know. Um, and as I was researching this book, I found out that he was, um, he got the nickname because he was an expert sharpshooter in the Army. Um, so he was, a, you know, he was an Army guy. He enlisted at the age of 17. He was involved in um, several battles in the Korean War. Uh, he did two tours of duty. He became a paratrooper with the 187th in Infantry. Um, and he was so fearless that he won both the silver and bronze stars for bravery. So here's like another normal guy. Um, but when he returned from Korea, uh, he hooked up with his younger brother, Vincent, who was just as evil as Steve Flemmy, if not more so, and also uh, Joe Barboza that we just talked about. Um, and uh, coincidentally, the gangland war um, was going on at that time in the early 60s and 70s, and these guys became contract killers. Um, they were three unlikely pals, but they had a great business relationship. Um, by the time the calendar turned on the 1980s, though, they had amassed a victim list of 15. So they had murdered 15 people that they admitted to. Um, in, and this is um, Steve Flemmy here in, in a more recent shot. And uh, he's testifying in, in court in this picture. Um, these two pictures are probably one of the most vicious murders that um, these guys pulled off. The, both of these women were uh, Steve Flemmy's girlfriends. The woman on the upper left is uh, Deborah Hussey. She was the daughter of his common law wife. And uh, she was going to tell her mother that she was having an affair with her common law husband. And um, one day she uh, was murdered. And coincidentally, the murder occurred in the house next to where Billy Bulger lives. And the reason that happened was because uh, Steve Flemmy's mother had been mugged. She used to live in Madpan. She got mugged. Steve Flemmy was looking for a house where his mom would be, have a safe place to live. And, and at that time, the home next to where Billy Bulger lives, uh, still lives, I believe, was up for sale. They bought it. And um, they took Deborah Hussey to this house when she decided that she was going to tell her mother that she was having a relationship with Steve Flemmy, and Whitey Bulger strangled her to death in Steve Flemmy's mother's house. They then transported the body down the street and buried it in the basement of another home where they promptly, um, several years later, they had to dig up, dig her body up and move it again to the area near Tenian Beach. Um, 
the second woman, Deborah Davis, the striking blonde, was also Steve Fleming's girlfriend. And she met a similar fate when she tried to break up with Steve Fleming. She was also strangled by Whitey Bulger in the same house. Her body was also taken down the street and buried in the second home, which this is the home, this is the home where these girls were murdered. And if you look closely at it, it's like an all-American home with a white picket fence. And you could see, see through the trees on the right-hand side, you see a little flicker of red there. That's the American flag, so it's like an all-American home. And uh, here's where these two brutal murders occurred. And this is the home, uh, several uh, houses down on the opposite side of the street where the girls' bodies were buried. And what happened was eventually they, the homeowners of this house uh, went to sell it, and um, the uh, hoodlums had to come back in and remove the bodies and, and move it down to an area near Tenian Beach where they also had um, killed several other people and buried, buried them in this area. I'll talk just really very briefly here about the role of the FBI in uh, Boston's organized crime. Um, I hope you recognize this John Conley. He was uh, an FBI, a very uh, prominent FBI agent who developed a very close relationship with uh, Whitey Bulger. Um, Bev, why don't you tell the story about how they, they, they met? Um, John Conley often told this story to many of his FBI friends and, you know, his, his other associates. Um, John Conley was a little boy and lived in, grew up in South Boston. And as a little boy, uh, Whitey Bulger was fairly well known because even as a teenager, he was a, kind of a hoodlum. And uh, one day, John Conley and his little, little friends were in this ice cream store in South Boston. And uh, in walks Whitey Bulger. And uh, Whitey Bulger says, hey, you know, you guys want an ice cream cone? And John Conley says to Whitey Bulger, and my mom says, I can't take anything from strangers. Whitey Bulger picks the young John Conley up, puts him on the counter and says, oh, I'm not your stranger. I'm your pal. I'm your buddy, you know, and buys him an ice cream cone. And that's how the relationship began, over an ice cream cone in a, a South Boston, you know, ice cream parlor. And, and But John Conley would repeat that numerous times. And eventually it led to um, these guys ended up you know, having dinners together, uh, they celebrated Christmas together, they exchanged gifts. Um, they were really close in, in, in my, you know, in, in my mind they were anyway, because, um, you know, they were in constant cocktail all the time. And, and um, Conley often said how much he looked up to Whitey Bulger, you know, he was, he was kind of a folk hero, Whitey was kind of a folk hero in South Boston, so that's how the relationship really started. And I think one of the issues that the FBI uh, did uh, use to justify was to saying, well, we're using them to bring down the Italian mobs, we're using one bad guy against another bad guy, but when you start to do that, you get very caught up in this. Um, one, a case that's going to probably come up if Whitey Bulger goes to trial is the highlight murders here, which we won't get into, but Basically, uh, it is a web of, of uh, connections among Whitey Bulger, Steve Flemmy, um, a gentleman who ran a highlight uh, sporting event, um, uh, another John Callahan who was involved with that, and Paul H. Paul Rico, who was an FBI agent in Boston, who became a security um, for this highlight business. Uh, the mob got involved, they got, uh, the owner of the business got concerned that the mob was involved. He was killed, Johnny Matarana was hired to kill him. Then they were worried that the, uh, another guy might talk, Johnny Matarano killed uh, John Callahan. And involved in the whole thing was a former FBI agent, H. Paul Rico, who is uh, pictured up there. So you can see that the connections went very, very deep. Um, and we'll just go through some of these slides to show you that uh, about the end of the search for Where's Whitey. I think you all recognize this poster, his girlfriend, girlfriend, headline when he was captured, is Whitey Bulger today or soon after his arrest, the announcement of his capture. And it all raises the question, though, why did it take so long to capture Whitey? And we have some, we have some thoughts about that, what we might, we might talk about during the Q&A period. Um, we'll just go through this part fairly quickly. Um, one thing that we did in the book was to include places where um, events in mob history happened. And this is uh, not just for the lurid fascination, but we discovered as we were doing this that 
It was all over the city, all over in all kinds of different neighborhoods. So you can't really say that organized crime was, uh, was um, confined to any one area. It went, went all over the city. Um, Somerville, this is the former Marshall Motors where uh, Whitey Bulger uh, and uh, the Winter Hill Gang used to hang out. Uh, it was a garage, it's now a church. This is uh, a bakery, used to be a bar. It's uh, right on Broadway. I pass this almost every day, right in Somerville. Uh, I include this picture because this is the garage for the uh, Brinks robbery, if you knew of that case. And I love the fact that the uh, Freedom Trail goes right by it. So it's kind of uh, two landmarks in one. Uh, this is there. this is Cafe Pompeii in the north end, and if you you go up to the north end now, you'll you'll see it's still there. This was um, um, the meeting place um, of Donato Angelo. He used to have a little office in the back room there. So if you go in, you might want to ask where where he had his uh, office. Uh, this I don't know if anyone recognizes this, but um, this used to be Francesca's on North Washington Street in the North End. This was where uh, the Angelo brothers were arrested. Uh, Jerry and two of his brothers and a third brother was later arrested um, getting into his car. But the, um, the interesting thing about this is um, as the feds were leading uh, the Angelo boys out in handcuffs, uh, Jerry turns around to the other diners and says to them, I'll be back before the pork chops are cold. Needless to say, he was not. Uh, one thing we also emphasize is that organized crime is not confined to any one ethnic group there, or we talk about some of the operation of the Tong gangs in Boston. There was also uh, one of my first stories when I came to Boston for the Associated Press was to cover a massacre in an after hours club in this air, uh, place on Tyler Street, I think it is, in Chinatown. Um, this is actually a very old picture from, I think, the 1920s, um, and it talked about what they called Tong Wars, which were Chinese gang wars during this period. Um, South Boston, this is uh, a site of the, the former Triple O's Bar, which where um, Whitey Bulger and a number of other people hung out. This is right on uh, Broadway. Uh, this is the liquor store where Whitey Bulger sort of muscled his way into owning, and where, coincidentally, a winning ticket for the lottery was sold, which was coincidentally went to Whitey Bulger. Uh, church where uh, the Bulgers and the Connollys, I believe, both worshipped. Um, why don't you talk about this image here? Um, this is a, an interesting picture because uh, we haven't really touched on Kevin Weeks, but um, I know Stephanie mentioned that Kevin was uh, Whitey Bulger's protege. And this shows just how close they were because the condo on the left was Kevin Weeks' condo, and the condo on the right was Whitey Bulger's. So they were, they were quite close, despite what you may hear Kevin Weeks say when he's on the radio talking about uh, Whitey Bulger. That's in South Boston. Uh, Castle Island, uh, that's not Whitey, I'm sorry. Uh, Charlestown, obviously there's a lot of history there. We'll just go through his notorious hit at the 99 that you might remember. And now uh, we'll just finish up with just a, just a brief discussion of how the mob has figured in Hollywood. A lot of people outside of Boston know of Boston's uh, criminal organized crime history through the movies. And one of the most, one of the recent one, which was very prominent, was this movie called The Town. And I draw your attention to the, the nuns, the, the grotesquely masked nuns. And this seems a very odd um, kind of image, but actually is part of a heritage of Boston crime history to use these kind of grotesque masks. For example, going back to the Brinks robbery, um, you have an old movie about the Brinks, and then you have a book about the Brinks. And again, there were masks used in that in that uh, robbery, but they're always depicted as horrible, grotesque, evil-looking masks. Um, this is from a movie about the Brinks robbery from 1950 called Six Bridges to Cross. That is supposedly Tony Curtis under that. That, that one is not particularly grotesque, but it's a very bizarre mask. Um, and this is from the movie The Brinks Jobs, starring Peter Falk. And again, you see the mask playing a role here. Uh, this is another TV movie about the Brinks, and again, the mask plays a role. This is, these are the actual masks, um, Captain Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. Um, and the FBI was able to identify that these were the actual masks used in the robbery. Um, 
one thing in some of our lectures, right, we play little clips of, of some movies. Uh, if you want to really get a sense of what it was like to be uh, sort of a, a foot soldier in uh, the underground of Boston uh, during this time period, uh, please rent The Friends of Eddie Coyle or read the book by George Higgins. It's excellent. It really gives a good feeling about that. Um, and it also, in the movie, also has the mask. Did anyone recognize this fellow? This actor? Okay, I'm, you, you will in a few minutes. So, um, But there is also a play based on the Friends of Eddie Coyle, and it's been, been produced um, around the era. You may see it, and I would, I would encourage you to go see it. Um, so going back to the Irish mob war, um, I told you about the, uh, the start of the war, which probably when a girlfriend of this gentleman here, Alex Petricone, was groped and it started this war. He was arrested. Um, but he was never charged with anything, and he went off to Hollywood where he developed a career playing mobsters, and you probably know him from the scene in The Godfather. This is Alex, actor Alex Rocco, who really blurs the distinction between real life and Hollywood uh, in the way that he was on the verge of being part of this mob. Had he stayed in Boston, he probably would have ended up dead in a hit, like some of the other pictures that we, we showed you. But instead, he went off to Hollywood and made a career out of playing mobsters, a very wise career move, we might say. So that's just a little bit of a taste of what, it's, of what we have in the book and this amazing story of Boston's uh, mobsters. It, it, it is, we had to remind ourselves, no matter how fascinating they were, and they were fascinating, uh, there is a lot of sadness and there is a lot of tragedy in, this, in, this, in these stories. So we really appreciate your attention. Uh, we'll stick around for some questions, but thank you very much for coming out tonight to hear us talk. Do you have any theories about the Gardner heist? <laughs> It, you know, I, we are, I am asked about that all the time, and um, we considered including this, but because it, 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 we, we feel like there's so much still up in the air about that. One of our comrades uh, or com at, the, at the Herald, uh, uh, Tom Mashberg, did quite a bit of uh, research on that. Um, so we did not include it, but you know, it's funny, everyone is so fascinated by this, it might be, make another book at some point. You wanna talk about that at all? Um, I, I'm still at odds over who could have possibly committed that, because I, I don't know. I mean, I heard that um, this hoodlum, uh, I think his name was Conley, I don't quite remember all the details. I did cover it for the Herald, but um, I don't remember all the details. And um, I, don't think it was, I don't think it was the um, Italian mob. I don't, I, I'm just totally confused about who could have possibly done that. There's some thought it was an Irish, there was Irish connection, but it, it really remains confusing. There's actually a couple books on it right now, so. Uh, but it's, it's a fascinating, it was one of the first things I covered when I came to Boston uh, as well, and it's a fascinating story. Um, we had another question. Hello. Hey. Um, do you have any idea how big the Boston mob scene was in the years you've covered relative to other major cities in the U.S.? Are we small potatoes or are we pretty cool? I, oh, we're cool. We're definitely cool. Uh, I think per capita we're right up there. <laughs> um, uh, I think that Boston's a smaller city, so we had a smaller population base. But I don't think we had as many mobsters as New York, but I think per, ca per person we were, we were right up there. And I, I think I could prove this by asking people how many people here knew of somebody or had a friend of a friend who was involved, and I'll bet you a lot of hands would be raised. So I think there was a, there was a lot of activity. Was it as violent, was it as vile as, as some of the other places? Maybe not, but we had some pretty, pretty nasty folks here. Thanks. Anyone on the left side of the room? Come on. Are either of you afraid for your lives mm -hmm. because you've written so much about this and also in the Herald as well as the books and, and the speeches and things that you've been talking about all this time. 
I'd like to say that we're pretty far down on the list, that I'm sure there's other names that they would like to get before us, number one being Howie Carr. <laughs> but I think we're pretty far down on the list. No, I don't, we're not afraid of that. No, we, <laughs> most of these people are, are pretty um, far gone. And one thing we did was we stuck to um, secondary sources. So we took things that were already out there. Um, so I don't think we were, we were putting much in that hadn't been discussed. So uh, in the one hand, it was no revelations. On the other hand, you're not going to get popped for, oh, I didn't want that out there, that kind of thing. So, but thank you for asking. Any other? Back over here. Okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you found any connections or significant parallels between either the Irish or Italian mob and any African-American organized crime, uh, particularly in the 60s, 70s. Not so much officially, but uh, there, was some interest, there were some interesting aspects to the African-American experience. For one thing, some of the mobsters would actually be very much involved with some of the black restaurants and black clubs. In fact, there was one uh, gentleman, it's the name of the, the chef, he was called the chef, where some of the mobsters were actually investors in his business when other people would not get involved. So there was a lot of sort of informal con connections there that we came across. Uh, so. It was interesting that way. Also, uh, I think that that the, they tended to be in the same sort of social situation. You know, in terms of um, certain nightclubs and certain businesses, there was more of a connections on a personal level there. But in terms of, uh, we didn't run across any major organized African American group. But that does not say that didn't exist. We just didn't come across it. But I remember being very struck with how uh, this one gentleman was having trouble getting funding for his restaurant. He, they, they helped him out. It got in his way when he wanted to move to another location. But he went on to have a very, very successful career as a chef in Boston. So it was, it was, it was, inter it was interesting to see some of that. I, I don't know if that answers your question. but but um, there, there probably could be uh, another book on that topic. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, do you have an opinion on law enforcement and their relationship to all of these t criminal enterprises? Well, I would say, well, one thing I could say more about the FBI. I'm not sure I could talk about the entire police um, force, but I will say this. I'm often asked about what surprised me the most in terms of writing this story, excuse me, writing this book. And I think one of the things that really surprised me was the back and forth and the collusion, and I would use the word collusion, between members of the FBI and particularly Whitey Bulger and Steve Flemmy and the, the information that flowed back and forth. I knew that history. I'd been living here for a long time. I knew it. I read it. It was all in the, pay, in, the, um, in, the, in the news. But when we started to write it, when we had to actually spell it out, and you read reports where um, John Conley would tell a mobster, one of the mobsters, where another mobster would be so that he could go kill that person. And then there was a case of, uh, I think it's Teddy Deegan, where there was a sort of conspiracy that the law enforcement knew that the people accused of the crime hadn't done it, but they prosecuted them anyway because they wanted them off the streets. So there was um, a, a kind of a wink, wink on that. The other thing I think was striking is that there was, the Bulgers were not unique in having families with people on both sides of the law. So I think there were a lot of close connections. Now, this is not to imply that um, the Boston police were corrupt in any way. Um, this is just to imply that there, was a, there were a lot of connections. I think what, what, is, what was terrible was the FBI's use of Whitey Bulger as informants and then look the other way where they committed some really heinous murders, really heinous murders, these, these girls, for example. How could they not have stepped in at that point? But apparently they didn't. Do you want to add anything? No. OK. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the psychology of these guys and their whole underworld enterprise. I mean, were they self-proclaimed bad guys? Were they proud with their black hats? Was, were there, was there some kind of delusion or uh, uh, you know, righteousness about what they did? Uh, did they feel like they were you know, 
getting some sort of right thing done in society that you know, society wasn't doing? Were they, was there fear um, in over their heads, that kind of thing, uh, or some combination of those? Well, it's interesting um, because we did think about that uh, as we were doing it. Uh, there are a couple things you could say about that. One is that many of these guys were not unintelligent. They were very smart. So you, you, you figure that they were not dumb. They, they, it's not like they did crime because they couldn't do anything else. Um, some of them had a lot of self-aggrandizement, that's for sure. But I think part of it was carks back to the immigrant mentality of being not part of the power structure so you don't owe anything to a power structure. If you start with the Italian, uh, the, the mob, I mean, this was happening uh, about the time of the Sacco Vincetti case, of which there's a lot of information. And I think this, this, the um, emphasis was, you're not, you Italians are not welcome here. I mean, if you find, I'm, a, I'm a very much a student of that case, and there was very much that emphasis. Same with the Irish. Same with the Irish, there was a kind of the anti. And King Solomon, being Jewish, um, I think uh, there was one interesting uh, quote from him where he, he, was, he was questioned, why are you so prominent? You're doing these things. And he said, because then they accept me. I'm their host then. And then he's accepted by the rest of society. So I think there was a sense, more of a sense of being outsiders who didn't owe anything to the structure that therefore they could work around it. You owed it to your family. Many of these people, aside from Whitey, some of these other people had like kind of normal lives. They had wives, they had children that they kept out of the business. That was part of the rules. That was part of the old rules of the mob game. You didn't target people's families. You targeted them. So I think that's something that's passing by the wayside now, but I think that was uh, part of it. And I think also that you saw that um at least in Whitey Bulger's case, and I'm sure in the Angelo's case too, they kind of were protectors of the neighborhood. They were considered Robin Hoods by their, you know, their, their colleagues on the street, the, you know, the storekeepers and the neighbors and stuff. So there was that aspect of it as well. 